generosity. So without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker. Dr. Joshua Fitzgerald is the Jeffrey Rubinoff Junior Research Fellow at Churchill College, Cambridge, and the second after Vid Simoniti, who's moved on to the University of Liverpool but is here with us today. Josh is a specialist in the material culture of Mesoamerica, particularly the Aztecs. He obtained his PhD a few years ago, not far from here, the University of Oregon, and he's fast establishing himself as one of the leading lights in his field. And this morning, he's going to talk about a subject that has many parallels to the present day, namely epidemics. He's going to explore the impact of disease in the 16th and 17th century Mesoamerica and the extraordinary artistic response to them. So I will hand over to Josh Fitzgerald. Thank you. It's hard to follow that. Uh, it was a wonderful introduction. Thank you so much, Karun and James, and or, all organizers involved with this. And thank you so much for hosting us uh, all. I've, I've already had a wonderful time conversing with everyone, getting to meet everyone. Um, hopefully this will open up. Um, and I just want to start by saying, you know, thank you also for the acknowledgement statement, Karun. I thought that was really powerful. Uh, the topics I'll be covering, you know, it is dealing with uh, um, a hard and traumatic experience for indigenous communities, uh, in this case in Mexico. Um, <clears throat> and so it's a sensitive topic that still has a relevance today, and especially um, in the sense that we ourselves have gone through uh, episodes of trauma recently in both disease and then also conflict warfare. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, that's great up there. Yeah, I don't have, I don't have a paper, so I may, <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I'll go ahead and get started. <laughs> focusing on this concept of Cocolistli today. That's the way you would pronounce it in Nahuatl. That's the language of the Aztecs. I study Nahuatl. I've done language programs and work with Nahuatl communities uh, in a way to reclaim their heritage uh, through colonial documents, but also especially the artwork that was produced before and after Spanish uh, um, invasion of Mesoamerica. But I want to start with something maybe a little more familiar, uh, looking at Henry Moore and his, the way that he encountered Mesoamerica in his artwork. Uh, his reclining figures are based off of the Mool figure, which is a Mayan, well, originally thought to be Mayan specific, but actually um, it's, uh, and I'll show you how it relates to the Aztecs. But this was a moment in Moore's life that was, uh, you know, in this interwar period, uh, dealing with, as James talked about, the Spanish flu, uh, the World War I, he fought in World War I, came back and wanted to find himself, the son of a miner that didn't want to be a miner, he wanted to be an artist, and, and he explored artwork in looking through uh, books, but then also it was his travels in Italy, uh, in France, where he encountered masterworks, and he wanted to, in, in a way, react against that and locate uh, a different sort of story, and he came across in France this Chacmool plaster cast. This, uh, and this is part of a project that's just an article that I'm working on that's looking at more as the, 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 the missing aspects of the Chacmool as a sort of figure uh, uh, that uh, com comes into Moore's work. That's something I'm working on. But this is the Chacmool that he encountered, the plaster cast of it actually in France. This is the one that's in the uh, Museum of Natural, uh, of, of Anthropology in, uh, in Mexico City today. But you can see this uh, reclining figure and what's fascinating about Moore's take on it is he, he um, amplifies the femininity, feminine qualities, um, and, but, but holds on to this contorted, sort of twisted head of this uh, figure. And there's some of the, the column-like legs. He was infatuated with the bald stoniness of this object. Um, and, uh, and, and it came through in a lot of the uh, series that he produced over the life of his career. And there were other works that were Mesoamerican in nature. He, he, he developed his sense of primitivism around this, uh, this infatuation working in the British Museum on objects there. But you can see how it becomes abstracted and he turns, he moves to working in brass and bronze and, um, and, uh, and deconstructing the, these lines. But it's crucial that he finds femininity in this because 
anthropologists, archaeologists, had located it, and even to the present, as being a sort of a masculine, uh, a, a, a sacrificed warrior. But it's clearly actually has, when you read the um, iconography, it has um, the, uh, connotations for women, femininity, and, and, and birth, which is what I'll get to. But you can see in his papers his sort of uh, reasonings. But here's the Aztec variation of this. This is the Nahua version it's from the post-classic period. And it, it's a, uh, you can see how these were um, addressed. They, had, they were painted, covered in paper banners and feathers, and they had a performative quality where offerings were made atop this disc that this figure is holding. But you can see that contorted head that uh, Moore was infatuated with. Um, but so that for the Nahuas, these objects uh, had, had a perfect, uh, important story to tell. And the crisis of Spanish colonialism, the crisis of disease that uh, comes in right at the moment of encounter, uh, destabilized uh, the physical object as well as the stories around it. And so this project's looking at the uh, Valley of Mexico and the Puebla Tlaxcala Valley, these two regions in Mexico. You can see Tenochtitlan. Oh, and I'll have a case study on Calpan that I'll show you at the end, but I want to start by locating us in Tenochtitlan or today's Mexico City and putting the Chacmul where it was situated at one point, and that's in the Templo Mayor. If you've been to Mexico City or you've seen it on TV or if you've watched a Disney production of The Eternals where you have a thousand uh, Templo Mayors filling the screen, um, it's this sort of terrible uh, ideation of, uh, of this concept. But these, this temple was a central fixture in the city, and it had at the top uh, a temple devoted to the deity Tlaloc, or this rain deity, uh, fertility, mucky earth, stuff that was fertile for growing food and resources and culture uh, to persist upon. But then also, he was associated with disease and healing. Uh, the, the, if one had uh, pustules or um, um, uh, any sort of uh, a gout, anything that made you look almost as if you were drowned or a body, a body uh, uh, embodying drownedness. Uh, it was associated with Tlaloc, and then in some way, the uh, Chakmul figure. Um, this was, uh, as I said, intervened upon by Spanish colonialism. Uh, this sort of, uh, it went against this uh, maybe uh, idea of Christians, this um, uh, idolatrous sort of behavior of having these objects, casting them down and being destroyed. All of this, um, in, in a way, it uh, attacked material culture, it toppled objects and topped them with Christian um, um, churches and, and uh, spaces for learning. And that's what the book project is going to be, um, at, you know, when it's finally coming out, it'll... Um, highlight. But so I study these uh, renditions of learning environments. These are sort of models from the post-classic period. We have a smaller personal sized uh, temple model on the left and on the right, and that's at Cambridge that I'm working on, but on the right we have this more, one you may have seen, um, popular image. It's the, um, in the museum in Mexico City, but it's also a reduced scale model of a temple. And scholars have uh, associated with this concept of sacred warfare. Okay, so looking at the iconography, this is part of the story about the Aztecs that is perpetuated in the literature about this, this bloody, bloodthirsty, warfaring society. And so this symbol, Teo At Tlachinoli, is the word for a burnt uh, thing, so a burnt field, a scorched earth, and then divine water. And by focusing primarily on the scorched earth aspect, we lose a lot of the... Uh, feminine qualities that come in with, uh, with the divine water aspect. And so I'll highlight those. If we turn the Teocali around, on the back of it, you see this image. And if you know the story of the Mexican flag, you have the image of a bird city, uh, standing atop, perched atop a cactus with a, a snake in its mouth. Well, that comes from this post-classic period where this story was being told about warfare. It's not a snake, it's not a serpent. It's, uh, it's this sacred warfare symbol. And water's part of it. Um, but this was the foundational narrative of the Aztecs. They could tell the story about they founded Tenochtitlan by finding a, an eagle perched atop a cactus, and it was a flowering cactus plant, and they knew this is where they should build their massive city of Tenochtitlan, right? So this Teocali, in a way, reduces that narrative in a three-dimensional fashion. 
and there's a better image where you can see maybe some of the iconography better, better. scholars have focused so heavily upon this warfare concept and, uh, and, and the kind of bloodletting, the sacrifice, they miss this figure at the base. And Barbara Mundi, the art historian Barbara Mundi, has recently uh, talked about this figure being crucial, this feminine figure at the base as the, the um, center of growth of the city. It was crucial that uh, women and uh, this process of birth developed here. But we can see the, um, the p posture, right? The legs uh, bent up, the knees raised, the hands cl back clasping the earth, uh, the head almost contorted. We can't see it's been uh, uh, stripped away a bit. I'm at, oh, sorry, there's an image to kind of highlight that. And then from her abdomen grows the cactus. Um, looking at post-classic imagery, and sorry, I'm going back to this, you know, pre-16th century of it, just to give a little bit of this background, but we can read this iconography in these manuscripts that are written in the Nawa Mishtek style of writing. And it's a lot, it's a jumble here, so it'd be hard for anyone to kind of pull it apart, but so I'll try and highlight some of the things. We see a courtyard, walled courtyard, with four openings, uh, figures entering the space and they're ritualizing an activity, and this is actually what scholars have shown is a, a concept of women's menstruation, their first menstruation, the, uh, and the uh, act of a ruler being uh, enshrined. And these two go to hand in hand, almost a political and a social act aspect. And I'll show you how that looks by highlighting the fact that this figure, this bat-like figure, brings a heart into the courtyard space. It descends down, pouring with this precious water, which is filled with flowers and precious stones. The, the heart descends into the hands of this figure at the base. The figure ingests it, and then from her abdomen, that heart sprouts forth this flowering plant, and atop the flowering plant is perched a hummingbird male figure. His nose is pierced, and he is the new ruler taking his place. But that figure at the base is crucial to the story. Leaving her out of it and focusing only on the noble who would go off to be a warrior uh, leaves out that whole uh, part of the story, right? Um, and so finding this aspect of rebirth in warfare and conflict and moments of crisis is crucial. And we can see how, you know, it just kind of repeats this narrative. And these are documents and objects that maybe hadn't been in conversation whatsoever. So the story, the narrative's there. It's rolling around in, in, uh, at the time. And we see this in materials, ethnographic materials from the colonial period. And so this jumps us up a bit in time, but we can see uh, we, we can't find the chakmul in, image, in, in any imagery. There's no evidence of it. Um, but it, when we look at the posturing of women giving birth, we see uh, a chakmul-like figure um, in, in a similar sort of fashion, the contorted the body, grasping the ground, the knees raised. So it, this highlights this fact that the chakmul and its association with tlaloc and then disease it, it, um, how important birth and the role of women in this whole uh, process. And that comes from the Florentine Codex, a manuscript that was created in the 1570s, at, at almost the nadir of epidemic outbreaks in Mexico City. So many people were dying at this time that uh, some of, uh, scholars have argued that the Florentine Codex was an, uh, the only way to keep hold of the past. And it's crucial that you look at the visuals and the art, uh, artistry of the manuscript to unlock the, the history that's in there, because the artists were using indigenous traditions from the past, calling upon their, uh, their uh, practices to recreate these stories. But we can see in the Florentine Codex uh, the effect of the crisis. People are dying, there's not enough resources to actually muster enough pigment to paint these images you see before you. Thus we have an almost unfinished manuscript, an unfinished work. Uh, when we think about filling in the dots, filling in the lines, coloring these uh, stories, and how it's affected by these cycles of epidemic disease. So the Nawa Christian converts who are helping to create this manuscript are interviewing their community members, their elders, tracking histories, and then in this book 12, they record the first uh, uh, evidence from the Nawa perspective of uh, the conquest in visual and text form. Um, that's uh, challenged by the Christian narrative that comes along later. So right after, in the 1520s, they're building things in these same spaces, doing this act of toppling and topping. And so this crest from one of the first monasteries that was uh, created at the time, you can see a similar 
uh, narrative structure in, uh, in, in, in place. We have an eagle figure perched atop uh, an object. That from its mouth is a biblical scroll now uh, from uh, Christian tradition, so a different type of maybe sacred warfare. Um, and beneath it, instead of a plant and instead of a feminine aspect of fertility and birth, we have the Christian world. And it's uh, usurped that position, that, that ability to tell that story. Uh, surrounded by water glyphs in an indigenous style. So we know an indigenous hand was involved in this process. We know that someone is telling a story and, and, and uh, imposing, uh, superimposing this uh, new narrative alongside it. So this all gets back to this idea of kokolisli. And this is the Nahuatl word for, uh, tra translated as pestilence, sickness, disease, and epidemic. And the, the, the idea of Kokolisi actually goes deeper. It's deeply, uh, it affects uh, uh, Mexicans to this day on a deeper level. It goes into this concept of susto, this, this concept of fear that causes so much stress and anguish and trauma that it actually affects you. As my colleague, uh, Rebecca Dufanak puts it well, a loss of a person's vital force due to the fright caused illness far beyond the initial frightening event. So there's a generational aspect to this. And how, do, how does art therapy and recovery compete against this concept of Kokolisli? And we see Kokolisli uh, in the Florentine Codex in Book 12, where we have a massacre. We have the community trying to recuperate itself, cleaning the, the, away the bodies, uh, wiping away the blood to, to put back on this ritual they were trying to put together when the massacre occurred, and then uh, outbreak of epidemic disease for one of the first Document, documented depictions of this from an indigenous perspective. And this image is crucial because, <laughs> I mean, it has so many layers. We have the indigenous woman uh, speak, coaching the body that's diseased in a way that looks uh, positioned similar to uh, that image of birth. Um, we have uh, the idea that this is actually being recorded visually at a time when they're, the, the Nawa artists brothers, sisters, mothers, families are being racked with uh, disease. So these, the models that we're seeing here may have been their family members recorded in a time when they're recording the history from 1520, but it's, uh, taking pl it's documented in 1570. So the art captures that, fit, that, that community uh, at the same time that it's telling a history. Then we see women speaking down to the patient, uh, trying to soothe them in this and, and the Nawat accounts, and I didn't include them because it is pretty harsh to read, but the body is just contorted in pain because you can't tilt the head, you, can't, you can even gasp for breath because of the smallpox that's uh, having its way with uh, your body. Then we see this in other documents, these sort of hybrid documents where we have pictorials and Spanish glosses. Uh, uh, they record, Nawas recorded their encounters with disease um, very clearly to track it for their communities, right? These are Nawa documents made for Nawas who could also speak Spanish and painted in this way to, to communicate these ideas. Um, in other documents, uh, we also see uh, disease and then the attack on architecture, right? Um, but what's fascinating is how the community immediately latches on to you know, they're, talk, they're documenting disease, but then also the new architecture they're creating, the new forms of, of, um, of creating a sense of community that they're documenting in their work. And that's what I do with the book project is tracking architecture, trying to find uh, evidence of what visual uh, um, re rebirth, revitalization can look like in these new uh, modalities. And that's just the book project that hopefully will be finished soon. And just asking questions about how students shape schools and they're shaped by those learning environments. We're supposed to be ripping away or unseating these um, idolatrous behaviors, but really they allow for um, the persistence of cultural identity. And uh, in this book, I'm putting forth this concept of the learning scape and the visions of what learning is, whose vision we're seeing, and it speaks to what uh, architectural historians have looked at in, in some of these spaces um, already. So building upon a lot of really great work about place-based studies. Um, and so this is just a case study. I know, uh, just to wrap up, I'll finish up here, just to show you some of the work that I, I've done in communities. Um, this is in San Andres Calpan in Puebla. If you haven't been, there are, it's a UNESCO uh, heritage site with uh, several uh, in, a, in sort of sister 
um, sites, old ex conventos that you can go to, and tourism is so crucial to Mexican uh, economy and communities uh, that it, it, if you haven't been, you should definitely go and see some of this artwork in person when we can, when it's safe. Uh, um, but I'll just focus on uh, this uh, Calpan. This is the courtyard, and I focus on open-air courtyards. Uh, this is an invention in the Americas, although some uh, scholars have argued that it had a, um, traditions in Europe. Uh, there is a clear influence by Mesoamerican um, uh, forms and uh, architectural programs. And I'll just focus on the one posa. This is the first one uh, dedicated to, to Mary. And you would enter in this courtyard in procession and go through these different pauses, these, pose, uh, these um, stops in the uh, passion narrative, right? So it's a very Christian habit, behavior that's going on, and a lot of uh, biblical uh, art and references on this, these types of small chapels. Um, and in a way, you could read them as that uh, dogmatic uh, Christian form of reading the object. Um, oh, sorry, it's kind of a timing issue there. Um, but you can also read them as a Mesoamerican Teokali. And they, some of the same concepts, suffering, uh, 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 Lord uh, enshrining a ruler, but then also this concept of rebirth and how that might help a community. Other scholars have looked at these and noted the adjectival borders. Uh, this is Susan Klein Moorhead, who has focused on these bound borders and, and shown that they relate to pre-colonial um, stamp work that, uh, um, that uh, highlighted the simple show sheet. If you've seen the movie Coco, you know this, this flower is like a gateway to uh, working with the dead or deceased. Um, uh, and so it's fascinating because in places like Calpan, these, the marigolds will grow regularly on, uh, around Dia de, Dia de Muertos, and so there is this sort of connection you can make. But going further in, looking closely at it, we have this aspect on the east-facing panel of, of uh, uh, the, the pain and suffering that Mary is going through. Uh, we have, and I won't go through this just to kind of move to uh, the part that I think is uh, interesting and move along to the next speaker, but we have in the south-facing panel Mary receiving her crown ascending into heavens. And I, you know, there's a lot of uh, iconography here that calls back to... Um, uh, to pre-colonial uh, local histories. But I'll focus here on the east-facing panel and Mary receiving the Spirit and learning from uh, uh, that she would have the, um, the Holy Spirit. And um, by reading this, and sorry to, to, to maybe not be able to see it, it's clearly on the screens there, but understanding this work of art in this sort of larger discourse, a longer array of things, we can see the repetition of some of these postures, some of these lines, some of these forms that come out in this... Uh, Teo Kali, uh, in a way. And uh, that I'll just kind of highlight those here. It's maybe obvious, the lily that separates Mary and Gabriel. And, you know, he, uh, he's bringing this holy script with him. Uh, it, it's a, a growing flowerful plant at the center. You have the Holy Spirit, a dove uh, above, uh, the perched above, sending down the word, the message. Uh, and, and, but also could be argued as rain or this precious divine water falling down upon Mary and her body in, in an indigenous uh, positioning of her hands in deference, accepting this sort of process um, in a way that the chapel, or I could call it a teokali, it's a three-dimensional uh, aspect of that story, that narrative of a founding moment of how important it is for uh, to grow and and and, and uh, to to find rebirth in and therapy in after moments of crisis. And so, if you think about this being constructed in the 1550s, 1560s, and up to the 1580s, all through these cycles of epidemic disease, um, Nawas are looking to. It's built by Nawa artists trained in European fashion, but there it can be read in these multiple discourses. And so just kind of concluding on this point, um, when we think about how uh, the questions of the, 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 the forum, it, it was really important for me to, to find Henry Moore's work because by understanding uh, that post the abstraction of these lines, these forms, and his, uh, his understanding of the femininity of this uh, object, it made me rethink the types of documents I was looking at, the types of spaces I was studying. Um, and so it's important how crisis it, um, affects construction of 
these t tangible, these material stories. And it speaks to Timothy Carroll's work, uh, who's looked at similar sort of uh, spaces in, uh, in England, um, in, in you know, uh, medieval, uh, late medieval. Um, but this concept of how a place can, can try to cohere and uh, bring things together, but then also have a, a possibility for multiple, a coexistence of narratives. Uh, and uh, that incoherence can exist in these types of spaces and in a, in a very important, meaningful way for people like the Nawas who are um, watching their neighbors sort of suffer and going through these, they, they, the building, the process of actually constructing a new place for a community was really valuable. And so what I'm continuing to work with on this is this, this idea of ocular proximity to the artwork, how the community would see uh, and read this, the, the iconography, circumambulation. When we were here yesterday, James, you know, had us moving about uh, Jeffrey's sculptures and, and finding, and that, that's something that, I mean, I'd already been thinking about, but it, it's fascinating when unlock, it's unlocked for you in a way, uh, in, a, in a real experience way. And then how that the ecology is, suffers from uh, going back to this concept of the Florentine Codex and not having enough pigmentation to just color in the one thing you want to color in, uh, the keep for, to track for, for, to preserve for time, uh, how that's affected, how the stones that are used that were from uh, pre-colonial temples and, and such. And so that's, uh, uh, and, oh, and then also the idea of, like you were saying, it's kind of, you mentioned earthquakes. These are still contested spaces um, by uh, uh, the violence of Mother Nature at times, right? And so conservationists were actually stymied in 2019 to try and fix this, one of these churches that I'm, I work on. It's so central to, like I said, you know, there's the capitalist, there's a commodification, right? Tourism is really important. But the community was still using this space regularly. Um, they couldn't fix it throughout a very traumatic moment in it, with COVID-19, people uh, afflicted with uh, the disease and unable to get to the communal center uh, that had sort of um, been enshrined in the community. And so knowing that there are these uh, um, uh, am ambient sort of factors that come in. And so that's, that's my, my sort of presentation, thanks. Josh, that was a, uh, a, a, a gr absolutely gripping talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I particularly admire your PowerPoint skills as well. Um, I'm sure there are plenty of questions. We've got some time, a good 20, 30 minutes or so for questions. Um, maybe, maybe actually 15, 20 minutes for questions. Um, so is, does anyone want to kick us off? I can always kick us off because I've got lots of questions for you. Um, the question I had is, can you, oh, Alan, yeah, please. Um, thank you, Josh. I'm intrigued by Henry Moore as a starting point yeah. for this inquiry. And um, of course, he is someone who experienced acute trauma through his experience of World War I. So could you tell, perhaps this is going outside the box a bit, but um, I'm curious about his knowledge about the, some of the factors that you bring to bear on that, uh, on, on the uh, Aztec work, if I, if I may use that term, yeah. that inspired him, and uh, the degree to which he was aware of, um, of its true function or not, or whatever. Yeah, I just, um, I, uh, I was just at the um, Studios and Gardens, and Moore's, uh, Moore Foundation Studio and Gardens, um, as I'm continuing with that, the project. That's, what, what I'm excited about that uh, um, project is, just like you're saying, Alan, I'm really interested in uh, knowing, and I know he's an artist, and I don't want to paint him as a scientist or a researcher <laughs> too much, because I know that's dangerous. But, um, but he was, and he tracked, he, you, and so part of the project is to see what sort of marginalia relating to Mexico are in his papers, if he, or in his photographs that he took over time, because he, he did develop this infatuation moving through each room of the British Museum, and he would find a form, uh, uh, he focused on, um, there was a fa there's a famous um, object that's actually in the museum in uh, Mexico City, but he'd seen it in books, and he uh, would take these notes alongside to create mother with child, where you see a figure sort of bearing down, in the ch or, or actually 
uh, embracing their knees and the babies coming out from um, underneath the knees, uh, the baby's head and face. And it's exactly like uh, the Shochipili. Uh, there's a statue in the British Museum that also informs that posture, the, the way that he um, interprets the work. So it's, it's fascinating to me, and that's one thing I, I hope that I can do with that article is not only to engage with his, his theory of primitivism, to see what can be salvaged from his concept of what is primitive art, but then also he was so fascinated with making uh, negative space, and piercing stone, mm -hmm. and there's something in interesting in Aztec, the piercing of Aztec stone uh, purposefully, sometimes to include uh, accoutrement, other uh, things that, you know, a uh, wooden uh, a staff or a banner that would be set in with the statue, and I don't know if Moore picked up on that in any of the work that he was doing, or if he just, um, because he's, you know, it's fascinating to think about artists who are working in like uh, 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 research documents that are black and white photographs and how you understand uh, something you're inspired by in black and white or two-dimensionally. And then when you encounter it in real life, and I'm hoping to find later on if he went to Mexico, uh, actually got to see these particular objects and, and what he wrote in his accounts. Because most of his early stuff is in his notebooks uh, in his early life. But I don't know if that really... But that's, that's what I hope to... Yeah, I, I was just thinking about Moore as an artist who's deeply engaged with trauma. Yeah. And uh, was involved in the um, memorial project to the Holocaust after World War II. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and was uh, uh, in his work, in, in a way, it's so affirmational of life. And to think of the horror and death that he'd lived through yeah. during World War I. I I've always uh, looked to some degree at his what people refer to as, as, as primitivism through the lens of this critical agency that has to do with an affirmational side yeah. of what it means to be a human being. Yeah, and, that, and, that's and, and, and you're bringing out something similar yeah. precisely in the, in, the, uh, or the, in the work of origin. And I was wondering to what degree he might have been that's probably an impossible question. I, yeah, well, I don't know because in his drawings, I mean, his a lot of people don't uh, skip his drawings are so colorful, mm -hmm. and I wonder if you know he picked up on any sort of uh, color, indigenous sort of patterns in, in coloring. But um, but one thing that a sort of personal note is that when you're looking at the reclining figure, um, he, he talks about this in his writings and he's in, in his interviews. Bless you. Uh, that that he. Um, you can see the spine of his mother in the reclining figure. And he, he talks about this, how he would come home after, uh, it was after the war, and, and she was home uh, often alone. She had a bad, she had problems with her back, and he'd have to massage her back. And he didn't realize until later that that's part of what um, he was uh, um, trying to, I mean, it was reflected in the sculptures he was producing. And the, that concept of a spine and, and a, a sturdy spine or a, you know, it's kind of interesting to think about how that sits with people. But yeah, in, in his drawings, the, the shelter, the period of sheltering and, and being affected, you know, um, it, it, being in the midst of an end game, I guess, and being bombed. Uh, I don't know, you know what, I can't even know what that was like uh, in one of my experiences. So, um. Thank you. Does anyone have? I can just remind everybody to say their names before they speak. Oh, uh, yes. Um. Yes. Uh, Jessica from the University of Victoria. Um, I was curious, actually, in your answer to Alan's question. I'm really intrigued by the idea of salvaging bits of primitivism, late, salvaging things from late modern notions of primitivism. And uh, I'd just like to hear more about how you go about that, because I've become more and more interested in how we're coming into a time where we're realizing we need to learn from indigenous life ways. Mm -hmm. And there's something, you know, that connects back to that early, that modern impulse of looking at indigenous art and being inspired by it, that uh, I wonder, can it be recovered uh, and cleansed from some of the colonialist, you know, uh, abstractions and misinterpretations. Yeah, yeah. Josh. Um, and I, uh, you know, I, I, I agree, Jessica, that like, you know, we, we see in architecture, art history studies, this idea of Indo-Christian art, or in, Indian Christian art, or, um, and we had primitive art uh, associated with that too. And there's this scholar who was in the UK, she passed in 2000, uh, 14, uh, Eleanor Wake, and I, my work is really inspired by her work, but she 
um, that's what she was doing herself was trying to figure out what, what can we keep, what, what's so valuable, what it, what it was valuable, what made primitive, this concept of the, the primitive so useful for um, artists and for scholars and what, um, how, do we, how do we better engage with indigenous voices in, because they, 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 it, well, it is inspirational and you can't just throw it all, you can't create a tabula rasa of, you know, this, like people were doing during the conquest, right? It's it just wiping it out because some um, activists in the states argue that uh, the California Spanish missions ought to be uh, reduced to rubble and the land returned to certain groups. Um, but by doing that, you're actually ripping away, uh, even though it was imposed, indigenous hands that crafted those Spanish missions. Um, they shouldn't be profited on by anybody other than those descendant communities, but um, by just uh, um, dismantling it, uh, we lose even that little, that little code, that little genetic code of what was important to the communities that had at one point converted, whether willing or, or not, uh, and, and manufact made a place for themselves. So yeah, it's a really important question, and that's why with the Nahuatl studies and working with Nahuatl communities, I think it's important to tell the stories that they want to tell, because I couldn't just say this is uh, not a Christian narrative, because the communities really care about that story, um, and that's what they're trying to preserve in their conservation efforts. So um, yeah, it's, I, I don't know if I can even really answer it yet, but I hope to continue to work on it. Uh, uh, James, I've, uh, just to link up one of the things that you were saying with Alan, obviously the, the word trauma comes from the Greek wound, and so when you are piercing a hole in a, or a negative space in a sculpture, you are in a way making a wound in that sculpture in some ways. But the, the question I, I had for you is, can you give, me, give us a sort of historical sense? I'm interested in finding out what kind of diseases, you mentioned smallpox, what kind of diseases were brought by Europeans to, to the Americas, and do we have any sense of the extent of the, the, you know, how, what percentage of the populations were, were killed or suffered as a result of those diseases? Yeah, there's, uh, so to answer the numbers, uh, I mean, I mean, it's hard to also put a number on something that, you know, like, it, it is a wound, and uh, any one person, I mean, any one community member uh, losing that person could be a serious wound, depending on, you know, how uh, that affects the community. So, but but yeah, the, there are maximalist and minimalist numbers. Uh, people have proposed as high as 90% of the population in in, in some areas. Um, there were uh, other factors that come in too, is you know time and generational effects. So that you actually you had uh, you know for for Spanish colonists, they didn't they didn't want the population to, to pass away. They wanted to you know in some sense they had a religious obligation to convert people and save their soul. In another side, they wanted laborers and people to continue to make buildings and uh, produce goods for them, and tribute was so crucial. So you had these moments when you would, they had early modern forms of inoculation. They would actually uh, uh, in, infect a child with smallpox because a child had more immunities and send them into a community to s start to uh, affect the population. So in a way, very ne nefarious but also uh, their attempt to try to save more lives than what they were afraid would be less. Anyway, so there's, I, I don't focus on the, the numbers, but, um, but yeah, so the diseases, I mean, smallpox is the first sort of idea, the typhus, um, one of the early, um, the 1540s, it was salmonella, um, that uh, and likely uh, from a change in diets, uh, the introduction of um, uh, domesticated animals, uh, pig, uh, pork, especially, um, or things of that nature. And so, um, yeah, they, it, the the concept of cocolistli, they they actually use different terms, and they use they'll use in their documents hue cocolistli, like a great sickness, great illness, great fear. And we have to remember that it's con this concept of fear, um, and um, uh, and, and then, and then others, uh, zawatli, which is another uh, that is a bleeding from the nose, or you know, and you see it actually in the visuals too, of um, uh, of figures um, uh, in different um, uh, the body uh, uh, being affected by these diseases in different ways, um, whether it's like the whole body covered in like a pock marks or um, so. Yeah, it's, 
Um, we probably have time for one more question if anyone has it. If not, we will move on to the next talk. Yes. And then we can uh, also answer questions later. Yes, and obviously there is time for lots of questions uh, throughout uh, afterwards. But Ambreen has a question for you. Ambreen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for a very interesting talk. And I was, by looking at the picture, it just gave me an impression that women particularly is represented as a symbol of rebirth and a source of healing in the images that you showed us. I'm just wondering, did you find any other images that would represent women in a different way, not only as a healing figure or rebirth or giving, uh, just nurturing the uh, disease or something like that, yeah. but some different kind of uh, representation for women. Yeah, um, that's that shows the complex, I mean, it is a very complex, I, I wouldn't wanna, I, I hope I didn't uh, just give you the impression that women were healers and about rebirth, but that's I, yeah, definitely what would come across. Um, in the act of giving birth, women were warriors and they were raising, this is at least in the sort of the literature, they're raising a new group of warriors. Women were coached by their doctors uh, and their voices, uh, women's voices were so powerful, they would shout at the women saying, you know, you, in a way of bearing down in labor uh, to grasp the child's head, not, not, phys not literally, but um, to grasp the child like a captive, like you would a captive, to pull out, to have a, uh, to raise a strong child in this way. To, women, when they went into childbirth, they would grasp, they would, they would have um, shields, they would have a uh, warrior regalia, in fact. I have an article that's coming out next month in the Getty Research Journal about this aspect of women as warriors that have been, has been totally left out of military histories, and it's only by studying the visuals that you actually start to find this story. But yeah, women's voices were powerful. They were a threat to men. There was a ritual where men would, uh, would uh, antagonize women moving along this procession in Mexico, in uh, Tenochtitlan. And the women would call to men, making fun of their hair, saying they're not, they were disgraceful, they weren't good warriors. And their voices were so powerful, it would cause men to have coco listli. They would have fear, not sickness, but they would be so frightened, it would be traumatizing to have these women constantly uh, telling them to be better people, uh, to be stronger people. So, yeah, um, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Uh, very complex, and that's just those two. I mean, there's multiple ways in which, and that's one thing I worry about. The work is uh, gender binarity in its study because I don't want to apply too much of the sort of like colonial gaze to, or a, sort of a Western sense of uh, binarity because there were sort of 